So I am working today from my undisclosed location in North Guilford, Connecticut, USA, where it's dark and cold and um, we are all hopelessly alone together here in America due to the COVID panic. So I think just within the frame of all of that, it's important to acknowledge that we're all suddenly alone together and um, with all that, that implies, right? So I have a feeling about this. Um, I have a feeling that this is probably going to propel us 10 years into the future in terms of executive leadership's willingness to actually listen to what we have to say. That's my hypothesis and the one I'm working from. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about my book and uh, my thoughts about things and then take some questions, right? So in 2018, Mark Sheffield and I wrote this book, Inviting Leadership, Invitation-Based Change in the New World of Work. And it's kind of a generalization of what we learned from 10 years of open space in organizations. So I've been uh, doing that for a while. You might be familiar with open space agility. How many people here have ever been to an open space event? Show your hands, just about everybody. Okay, how many people have ever been to an open space event inside an organization? Okay, and of that group, how many people actually um, produced proceedings from that event? Oh, much fewer hands. Okay, and of the group that put that had the generated proceedings from the event, how many organizations that they worked in where you generated proceedings actually acted on the proceedings and empowered people and authorized people to actually make some change in their company? Oh, even fewer hands. Okay, so that is a fundamental problem with the agile industry. So you might be familiar with open space agility. How many people have ever heard of open space agility? Couple people, okay. Is there anyone who has never attended an open space event ever in their lifetime? Show of hands. Okay, so everyone's seen open space. So I'm assuming that everyone has seen this which is a before and after open space idea, right? So we do some planning, we do an open space, we do 90 days or 45 to 90 days of experiments, and then boom, we produce some proceedings and out comes the proceedings. And then we act on those proceedings, not kidding around. So open space agility, you can get to it from openspaceagility.com, describes all that. It's an open source engagement model. It's not a framework. You add it to your framework. And the idea there is that for, the, for anything at all good to happen, people have to be engaged. Is there anyone who um, wants to debate me a little bit on that? Like anyone want to take the other side of the argument that people have to be engaged for this thing to work? In other words, you're going to argue that engagement doesn't matter. Is there anyone who wants to do that? Anyone at all? Okay, so here's a question for you. How come with these frameworks, Scrum at Scale, Scaled Agile, whatever, how come there is no emphasis whatsoever on the engaging, on engaging the employees? It's like, it's like magic happens here. It happens right here, except that it doesn't. Ever noticed that? I mean, you know, it's a little odd, isn't it? A whole industry dedicated to respect for people, but we never ask the people what they think or feel. I find that a little unusual. Um, I hope you do. Is there anybody who wants to make a comment here before I go any further with my, my rant? Yes. Yes, Catherine, please. My understanding to what you just mentioned is that uh, formal leaders are often very afraid 
and not sure of how convincing they are. Therefore, working on engagement, working on inviting, like you call it, in invitement-based management or inviting leadership is not a thing they are ready to do. Right. That is my experience. Right. Yeah. yeah, but now we have the COVID problem, don't we? Right? And all of a sudden, um, these executive leaders are sort of looking for the levers and wondering where the dials and controls are. Where's the control panel? Where's the dashboard? Where's the, how do I do this? Right? So working in open space, we figured out some things. It turns out that inviting is very engaging. Getting an invitation turns out to be very engaging. Why? Because you're put on a decision. And decisions turn out to be very engaging. So this is what, this is what it's all about. If people aren't deciding, they're not going to engage. If they're not going to engage, nothing good's going to happen. That's the premise. And the primary way to get people engaged is to invite them. Because inviting is uh, an invitation to decide. So if it's okay with you, um, I'd like to really kind of um, ask Pierre if we could go into like a little breakout session and maybe in pairs, we could do like a little exercise. Oh. How's that sound to you? Okay, we off. Just before we break out, I'm just gonna say hi. I just joined. Oh, hello, greetings. Hey, Dan, hey, it's nice Dan. It's really nice to see you. Okay, so, so here's, here's what we want to do. You want to invite someone. This is going to be a kind of um, exercise and invitation. So an invitation has clear goals. It has clear rules. It has a way that you're going to track progress. And then there's some kind of opt-in thing that's absolute. Okay? So here, I'm gonna invite you all to dinner. You're all invited to dinner at my house next Thursday. We are planning eight courses of food and nine different kinds of wines, which we will sample. We, I'm promising good food and even, even better conversation. And our dining room actually has 20 chairs. So we're inviting 10 of uh, the first 10 who, who, um, say yes to the invitation, may optionally bring a friend. We'll need you to get there by 6.30 and it'll end around 10.30. And um, I hope you let me know by Tuesday. So find wine, find food, find our conversation next Thursday. You can invite a friend. I hope to see you there. What is the goal of this event as I described it? The dinner, what's one of the goals? Having lunch. Dinner, actually. That, yeah. What's another What's another goal? Drinking. Uh, Find conversations. Drink. Meeting yes. people. Yeah. Conversations. Right. Yeah, conversations, wine, food, right? So those are the goals. So we got, we got that much, we got that much figured out. What are the rules? Um, can I ask you a question on that about the goals? Sure. Um, because when you when you take an organization as a unity of or a, a, a community of purpose, then the goals play a certain very important role. When you play when you take something like friends and families, I would suggest that this is more a community of destiny or of fate. And the question is whether you can, you know, whether you can copy paste what you know about goals and think about goals in an organization that is either commercial or, or a government agency or something like that that has a, a purpose to a private thing like a dinner. Okay, that's fair. Businesses are goal seeking organizations, but people are generally goal seeking too, and they want to know what's in it for them. So what kind of food is there going to be there? What kind of wine is there going to be? How long is this dinner? Like, what, you, what exactly are you inviting me into? Yeah. Have you ever been invited into something that's vague or uncertain? 
where you don't really know what they're inviting you into. You get an invitation, but it's a little vague. Sure. Anyone ever experienced that? Oh, yes. Yeah. All, my pro all my projects. Okay. All right. It's so cool friends, and that's enough. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is take the ambiguity out of it. So what are some of the rules? In that the start time, start time and end time. Start time and end time. Very good. Other rules? Politeness. Invited to answer before Tuesday, I think, or something. Yeah, RSVP before Tuesday. Yeah. Bring a friend if you want to. Yeah, there was a special authorization. You may bring a friend if you wish to at your option. I trust you to bring someone interesting, right? Uh, the first 10 will only this be... 10 and then that's it. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. How are we going to track our progress through this event? We've got the goals and the rules. What, how will we experience progress? What's one way? The courses. Yeah, how much the, the courses of food, that's one way. What's another way we're gonna track progress according to that invitation? The wine. How many, yeah, how many wines? wines. How many wines, that's exactly Nine right. Wines. Yep, there's another pretty obvious way we're gonna track progress. Where the, where the people time. Come for the meal. Time. The time. The time, that's right. Yep. So we're all going to experience progress that way. And then, is anyone be compelled to come to my house for dinner? Nope. Can you opt out? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why am I teaching this? Because if you are going to teach inviting leadership and invitation-based change to executives, you need to know what you're talking about. Now, here's the thing where these executives will always engage in delegation. We're asking them to mix some invitations into their delegations. In other words, to add some new ingredients to their, to their recipe, all in the name of engaging people. So here, I wanna show you something about invitations. When you're invited, here's something that's true. <clears throat> It kind of gets in your head. So what, it, please, please um, go full screen with my image now. Please uh, go to speaker view so you can see this thing big, okay? When I invite you or you invite me, you get in my head or I get in your head. You know, what will happen in, in an invitational thing where we're going to invite people into an open space to discuss the, the transformation? What happens if I don't go? What will I miss? What happens if I do go? What will I experience? Who else is going? Are you going? Is my boss going? What is this invitation thing? Around here, we just get told what to do. You know, so all of these questions come into my mind when I'm deciding whether to go to this event or not. So invitations get into the head of the receiver and create a way to engage people. So you need to learn this so you can teach it to executives. So what I'd like to do is I'd, I'm asking, I'm requesting that Pierre break us into groups of two or three, and we will take a shot at inviting each other to coffee, lunch, dinner, have a beer, or something else using this structure. It's not as easy as it looks, so be prepared. You might wanna write this down Goals, rules, progress, tracking. I'm just going to add tracking. My, my, this is really terrible penmanship and my, my visuals are really bad here. Um, but what I want to say about progress tracking is that we want, it's also about feedback. So invitations, this is something you need to teach executives. Invitations generate feedback in a way that delegations cannot. Feedback is what good leadership runs on. So how about we get some? So write this down, these four things, and then let's break out and, and have a good time. And I'm gonna stay here with Pierre. So Pierre, please don't include, include me in a, in a group. Let's just break them into twos and threes, okay? Okay, hold on. You know, if it's threes, it might be 10 minutes, five minutes, you know, maybe 12 minutes. You have people moving away because oh, <laughs> we're losing people, my God. Okay, hold on. 
So I recreate my rooms. So we have at least two people in the rooms. So uh, I'm looking if you're in a room. And I'm gonna I'm gonna type this into the uh, into the chat, and then you, it'll be in your room when you get there. Okay. Okay. So uh, I can't remove in a room. Uh, so I put the mate in your room. You don't need to join, Daniel. So five five minutes. Is that okay? Yep. Good. I open the rooms. Oh, one left. Okay. Um, I guess the first thing is just come up with the rules that would be clear for everyone and then it would be simple as well in the yeah. invitation. Yeah. This is one thing. Yeah. So, okay. That's good. Did anyone else feel like a little difficulty or a little discomfort or non, non smoothness to that? And then can you I have thoughts about it? We had a situation where, you know, when I invite somebody to just to learn more about something from their side, their experience, for example, then I don't know what's coming. Yeah, very good. We're going to talk about that's beautiful. That's really, really interesting. Thank you for bringing that up. Great. Okay. Other stuff. Yeah, Olive, Olivia. Yeah. Hey. Um, I feel like I could have had something at the end of the invitation, like, asking for a confirmation like if the other one has any question because I didn't leave room for that and it might be okay and clear but maybe not I don't know okay all right cool thanks for thanks for bringing that up um anyone else want to express how that felt for them it's something they might have learned or whatever just hold your hand up like this if you got a question if you got want to say something then just say it is that it okay yeah S. Murray, sir. You got a little mute going there. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, uh, I was surprised by the amount of content. You know, normally I, I feel like my invitation would just be short, and, but there's actually a lot to go into it. Yeah, beautiful. So let me tell you a story about this. Um, I wanted to, I was going to California. I wanted to meet someone that I had met online. Um, I was going to this company, Adobe, we we're going to teach some open space there. And I invited this person to come to the Adobe thing and kind of help out because I wanted to meet them. And then I realized I wasn't really setting it up in a way that they could really say unambiguously yes or no to, you know? So I said, oh, let me stop and start over. I'm being really messy here. We were talking over uh, Facebook chat, you know? I said, let me stop and start over. And I did the invitation in this, in this three part format with the opt in, uh, fourth part. Boom. I got an immediate yes, because the person knew exactly what I was inviting him into in courses. When I teach this class, inviting leadership, we're going to be teaching this class in about a month online, inviting leadership. Um, Students often come back from the first session and I heard they, and they, they report in on what they've, what they've, what they did to apply some of these things. And I had one student check in on the second day and say, I've been inviting someone into something for over a year. They, they always say no, a passive no, they just never get back to me. I did it this way. I got an immediate yes out of them yesterday and we're moving on to the next stage in our relationship, which is totally awesome. I, that was, that felt really, really good to me. So if we're going to teach respect, lean is a pillar of, uh, or respect is a pillar of lean. And it's one of the core values of scrum last time I checked. If we're going to promote respect, maybe we need to respect the boundaries of the other person. I mean, just because you are my employee doesn't mean that you are my slave. Does it? I mean, think about it. Pierre's kind of going like this. Yeah. Kind of yes, kind of no. Let's, let's put that aside for now. And let me just say something as an empirical fact. I'm going to say something as a bald statement of fact. And feel free to challenge me. 
if the people don't engage in the transformation, there's not going to be a transformation of anything at all. Anybody want to take the other side of that argument? All right. Find so it kind of raises the, go ahead, please. You found transform, do you mean transformation, any kind of change? Any kind of change that's organized at the organizational level. If the people don't engage actively in the process of the change, there's not going to be a change of anything at all. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw something at you to, to kind of see how you incorporate that into this transformation. Sure. Um, you won't get good results if you ask the frog about how to dry the swamp. Well, frogs don't respond in English anyway, so. Yeah, but what I mean with that is if you, for example, if you have a cost-cutting reorganization that produces victims in the change, mm -hmm. then going for the engagement of everybody will only co um, create a lock, a, you know, a, a lock situation. All right, that's the, that's, that's the story you're sticking with? hope you integ integrate that you, you find some kind of a way in which you get the engagement anyway I want I'm gonna bring something up now that's 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 gonna probably blow your mind okay and here's what it is all change is grief all change has a grief element agree what you just described is a change that's going to cause massive amounts of grief in an organization. There's survivor guilt. There's broken friendships. I'm not going to see that person anymore every day. I really enjoyed them. We had this in common. Now we don't. There's going to be a lot of grief in the organization. If you have grief in an organization, uh, you have all kinds of dysfunctional problems. The primary use of open space, if you read in Harrison Owens' writing, for example, in the book Spirit or the book Wave Rider, he talks about grief work, organizational level grief work, okay? Open space is designed to take people out of despair and into hope about a new story. Open space is an invitational thing. And what are some of the requirements of open space? We need an issue that a lot of people care about. We need a decision time of like yesterday. We need um, a solution that no one person has the answer to, but it's somewhere in the group. It's held in the group someplace, but no one person knows what to do. And the fourth thing is that there needs to be high potential for conflict. Like people have very diverse ideas about what needs to be done next. I would say a company layoff before or after is going to generate a lot of these conditions. So what I would say is, if you're going to get real as a leader, why not get real in an open space? Just tell the truth and have a conversation with people and do, do the humane thing. You're not going to get anybody on board afterwards. Everyone's going to be putting a helmet on and ducking and covering and hoping that, they're, that it's over. And then there's going to be a long period of mourning that goes on. And the spirit of that organization is going to be down around the world. That's happening right now while we're talking. Company after company is, is um, experiencing this. So how about getting everyone in one room and ask them, ask them if they'll take half the money they're taking now? How about we have that conversation? And the theme is half, half the pay, question mark? And let's get everyone in one room and have that conversation. Maybe that's a way to actually make it through to the other side. You know, um, that's my feeling about things. And in general, I think an inviting approach is very humane. And I think in general that people respond to it very well. And if there has to be a layoff, after we have a hearing about who's willing to take half the money and who's not, hey, people feel like they have some sense of control and also some sense of progress and some sense of belonging in the decision. Those things are usually associated with good mental health, right? Sense of control, sense of um, progress, movement, and a sense of belonging. Um, inviting actually delivers that. So if people have to be cut, well, they have to be cut.
but why don't we have a conversation about it first and see what the group has to say instead of some closed door session, you know? I wanna tell you one more thing about this. I have an older sister and she was a executive in a large company. She got me on the phone about 20 years ago when I was, you know, a younger, much younger man. Actually, it was more like almost 30 years ago now. Thank you for saying that, Scott. Um, here's what she told me. I told her there was gonna be a layoff at the company I was working, a large insurance company. She said, you know what, Daniel, I would get out of there if I were you. I said, why? She goes, because I'm in on these meetings where people are being cut and it, the, the list, the bottom of the list changes every single day. It's like musical chairs. And when the day comes, who was ever on the bottom of the list, out they go in a body bag. And it's not fair. So if I were you, I would look for greener pastures. <laughs> and that's, that's the reality. So how about we get everyone in one room? But, but aside from, from layoffs, what about changes in ways of working? Why don't we get everyone in one room and have an open airing of concerns about the changes in the ways of working? When we do this, we're gonna put people on a decision to even come to the meeting, an open space meeting. And they don't even have to come to the meeting, but if they do, even then they're not required to do anything that they don't wanna do. This is going to tend to give people a feeling of control. So go ahead and just open up, go to uh, the full on speaker view here. Um, so you can, so this thing is big and take a look. This is the flow of open space, right? And it start, it starts with a circle. It ends in the circle, the small groups in the middle. This is the marketplace up here. The primary output is a book of proceedings, which become input into action planning. Okay. So we're trying to go somewhere here. We're trying to do something real. Something real usually includes the whole group. That doesn't mean that the whole group gets to be in on every single decision that gets made. But what it does mean is that the group as a whole um, gets to actually have some participation in the decision. And it's actually very, very good for the leaders, the, the executive leaders to figure this out. If you bring people into a whole group situation, you can gauge how ready they are to actually engage in a change. Do you really want to go and spend a million dollars on a so-called transformation where that money just might be up in smoke because nobody wants it? Why don't we, why don't we find out? And why don't we find out who the engaged people are who want to actually bring the thing forward, the champions, then we'll be less reliant on external consultants and more reliant on the people we already have, the people we're already paying, the people that are already engaged and already are there and invested and already want to do something. Why don't we create the conditions where they actually can do something to have some influence over their own work? And let's let leadership set the stage through an inviting approach that clearly describes the goals and the rules. So in this context, leaders are designers of experiences, not dictators. So I don't know how that lands with you, but I hope you find it kind of interesting. And I want to say one more thing about inviting. Inviting requires more rigor than delegating. Delegating is the easy way out of, of executive leadership. Invitation is a much more difficult prospect because you have to be much more disciplined in the way that those um, invitations are structured. So with a delegation, I, you, know, you can just tell me and I have to do it because I work for you. But in an invitation, you don't have to do anything at all. Now, one of the guys actually, it was Bernhard, brought up um, how I don't know what happens next. If I invite, I'm actually authorizing the receiver to be in charge of the timing and the content and the form of what happens next. Yeah. Why? Because that's called feedback. That feedback is very, very useful to you as a leader to know what's going on. Don't you want to get some read, some gauging of what's going on in your organization? So you need to teach that to executives. So that's what I'm getting at.
Anybody have a question for me on any of this stuff about inviting and how inviting requires more discipline, it's more respectful, it's I'll, especially, go ahead. I'll have a go, uh, Daniel, good to, yeah. to speak. Um, I've, always heard, I've often heard the phrase that at uh, difficult times, management go back to what worked in the past. And many of them won't have been in this open space and they'll see it as an area where there could be risk. So how would you engage with someone to say, look, it's a really difficult time. I know you're paid to lead this company. I know you've done certain things in the past, but I want you to step into the unknown. Well, in general, if you put the executives on a small open space experience that's executive centric, like get 20 or 25 of the managers, directors and executives in one room, they always have some issue, address some issue for two or three hours, one morning, one afternoon, take them through the process of addressing something in open space. And that's when it gets real for them. That's when it gets really real for them. Um, I, I just finished doing eight open spaces around the world for a global multinational company who was rolling out a set of core values across um, their engineering teams. And uh, that executive didn't get it until we did something internal with one morning with the executive team where they had an issue and they were dropped into an open space and they actually went at it in an it's open great, space. This, this executive, pardon me. It's a great uh, answer. Thank you. This executive had been to an open space at, at one of our conferences. They were actually experienced open space at a conference in Boston. And that's where I met him. But he said in the, vi in the testimonial video, it wasn't until um, he actually experienced it inside that he, it clicked for him. Boom. I love that. Okay. So another thing I want to ask you about um, is... First of all, could I just ask a quick question there? Because you've just said about, you know, rolling about core values. What happens if the feedback that you got adjusted the core values? Well, yeah, actually, here's, here's what actually happens. Okay. <laughs> here's what actually happened, just so you know. Um, this uh, executive was a good guy, well meaning, well intended, but he was still very commandy, controlly. And he wanted to name what the theme was. He, he, he talked about driving and the 10 core values and blah, blah, blah. And he wanted to, he wanted to name the theme of the open space. And I told him, that's not my guidance. My guidance is to crowdsource the theme, get some managers, directors, and other people, one room, I'll facilitate the meeting. We'll come up with a great theme. And then that'll be socialized throughout the company. It'd be, it could be really good for everybody. He's like, no, no, let me push back on that. And, and in front of everyone in a meeting like this, he went on for 10 minutes about how he was going to name the theme. Well, what I did was I wrote him an email and I described him, you know, that's your, that's your privilege. That's your right. But here's the following risks that I'm not assuming and you are. Okay. And I went to bullet and I bulletized those risks and then we went forward and let me tell you what happened at each one of the open spaces, people addressed exactly the issues that were of concern to them with complete disregard for the theme. That's what actually happened. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what actually happened. And if you want, I mean, I have a video testimonial of the guy. I could play it for you and you could see what he had to say. His eyes were completely opened uh -huh. and he had a huge aha moment and experience in his career, unlike any other. He told me that there was a set of people, there were two people on his leadership team who routinely, routinely complained about process things, about how it was stupid. And those guys not only didn't complain, they said, when are we doing this again? He goes, that is just off the charts. He goes, so on a scale of one to 10, this is an 11 for me. Because those two people not only didn't complain, I'm always hearing them complain, they actually were like, hell yeah, let's do this. And how did you, how did you deal with it that he didn't accept your 10 points? No, I transferred all of the risk to him. And I oh, you transferred all the risk to him. That was your way of getting out of it. That was your get out. Yeah. And I painted a very dark scenario. I said, all the money you're spending, all the time and effort you're putting into this could be all up in smoke. Yeah, got it, got it. Or, or people might not come to it, or yeah. if they come, they'll be dragging their feet, or you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Got it, got it. Thank you. That's good. All right. So, was there another question or concern about this? All right. So, how much time do we have um, here? Oh, you have the whole night. Well, we can't go for too long because I've I've got a um, you know, run off and, and, and do some training and stuff um, in about 
uh, an hour and a half, and I need a little bit of prep time. So how about we go like, I don't know, maybe another half hour or so? Half you an hour is good. Is that good with everybody? It's good. Yeah? Okay, so how many people have ever heard of the fishbowl? Yes. The liberating structure called fishbowl? Yeah? Yes. Okay. All right, all right. So um, I have a surprise gift for all of you. Because Pierre invited me, and because I like him, and because I like him, I like all his friends, which includes all of you, of course. I am committing right here, right now, to giving you a tool that you can use in your own um, uh, transformational work. It comes out of the Inviting Leadership book. I'm looking it up right now. And it is called the uh, Authority Circle. It is a modified fishbowl. And it is in Appendix B of the Inviting Leadership book. So I'm looking it up now to show it to you because there's a little diagram in here. Here it is right here. This is the fishbowl, okay? You can do it ahead of your open space events. You set up the chairs in a circle. The blue dots are high authority figures. They sit in the center. You as a facilitator tease out two or three or four big issues that they're gonna talk about 15 minutes at a time. Okay. And then the red seat is a blank seat. The blue dots stay where they are the whole time. And the blue, the, the red dot is the only one that's open. There's, there's three issues on the wall. You tell them, okay, we're going to discuss issue one and you instruct them as a facilitator. Discuss the issue among yourselves as if no one else is here. And then the leadership team has their conversation. And if Silvana reports to one person and I report to another and we're sitting together, we're having a good time watching our bosses interact around a real hot issue. And we're also noticing how it's going to affect our work and what their attitudes are, not just about the work, but about each other. In the second stage, the hot seat, the red dot becomes open and anyone in a green seat can come into the inner circle and address the issue that's on the wall. And they function as a conversational peer with the, uh, with the high authorized blue dots. They, then when they're done, they get up and they leave the seat open and another person comes in and another person comes in and another person comes in. Then you switch to the next issue and you repeat the process. What is this good for? This is really, really, really good for setting the stage on the open space. You're going to do an open space. Before you do it, you have an executive give their plenary keynote talk. Then they welcome everyone and discuss the issues and opportunities. Then we sit down, we do this authority circle exercise. And everyone gets a good idea about what, we're, what we can and cannot do in, in this company. Then we head out and then we take a break. And then we, then we head into the open space. That's a real strong pattern. If you, know, if you can't get them into an open space event, well, why not get them to set up the authority circle event? It, it opens up about this much space. They're risking nothing. It's tightly controlled. There's one seat open. If they're okay with that, then you can move into a ho ho uh, full on open space someday because they've learned how to open up about this much space with that red seat. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to send every single person um, through Pierre, I'm going to send that PDF, which gives the exact steps to actually um, design, plan and deliver a um, authority circle event inside, you know, the organization that you're working. Thank you so much for the gifts. Yeah, no problem. It's my pleasure. I, you need tools. Um, what are some of the things that we can do to get people going? Yeah. One of them is ask that leader to make a standing meeting optional. 
I was thinking about something completely different. I was just thinking back for the invitation part. So okay. my, usually in the invitation part, just because of my, my customers, they believe the invitation is the agenda. So agenda of the meeting is the invitation, which is not, right? Well, for an open space, it isn't. But, but for a typical meeting, it very well might be because it's inside the goals and the constraints that, that that's the uh, body of the agenda. What are we here for? And what can, what can you expect us to cover during the meeting? I think to have the agenda very clearly uh, laid out is, to, is uh, to make the invitation clean and easy to make an, amb an unambiguous yes or no. Good. If I don't know the goal and I don't know what the, what the constraints are, how can I really say yes? I don't know. I don't know enough to say yes. So I would, I would say that I would challenge that a little bit. I would say that the goals and the rules for a typical meeting will be populated with agenda items. Oh, this, this gives me a good idea to think about a clean invitation. Yeah. It is Judy here? No, she left. No, I'm here. I'm here. Just here? trying to find the unmute button. <laughs> Clean invitation. What do you think about? Um, I'm not sure. What, what kind of clean invitation, Pierre? <laughs> <laughs> by clean, by clean, I mean the kind of invitation that, that is um, that facilitates an unambiguous yes or no. And the best way that I know to generate an unambiguous yes or no is to structure the invitation with these four properties. Now, what's interesting about these properties, and Judy, I recognize you now as uh, an expert in clean language, and of course, I'm thrilled that you're here. I notice also that these four properties of a good invitation are also the properties of something else. Can someone tell me what it is? Those are the four properties of a good game. A good game has clear rules. A good game has clear goals. A good game gives me feedback on how I'm doing so I can track my progress. And a good game has, yeah, opt-in participation, okay? So it turns out that every invitation, now this is key, every invitation, we describe it in the book, it's an invitation to play a game or be a character or even an author in a story, a new story, okay? So when you invite, you're inviting people to play a game and be a character in a new story. Like when I invite you to dinner, I'm inviting you to the dinner party game. And when we experience that event together, we are all going to tell stories about, hey, remember that time when we went over to Daniel's house and you drank too much of the white wine. Remember that one? And then we, then we played that game. You know, you know how that goes. So the dinner will generate story, okay? The transformation will generate story. When we do open space agility, we teach that if the leadership does not tell supporting generative stories, that the, the effort will fail. And when we go into open space agility like this, so please, please go full screen on speaker now. What we're really doing in between these two open spaces is creating a chapter in the story. Okay. So there is a beginning, middle and end to this thing and it's framed. So we're helping people make sense of what is going on by giving it a clear beginning, middle and end. And then we track progress according to the action plans that came out of the proceedings. Um, who here has ever arranged an open space event in their lifetime, ever? Okay, a couple of people. Of that group, how many had a full on newsroom with proceedings? Oh, not the whole group, okay. 
So open space inside an organization is profoundly different than open space at a conference. So you might have experienced open space at an agile conference, for example, right? But usually the theme is weak. It's not really cohe it's not it's not something a bunch of people care about. It might be just something the organizer cared about. And we don't have high cohesion with each other because if I irritate you, you don't have to get upset because in one day this conference is over, right? And you can just get, you're done with me. But in an organization, it's very different. You have to see me tomorrow. We work together. So having a compelling theme is, is really, really key. Having a compelling uh, invitation that addresses the theme is key. And then generating proceedings, having a newsroom, and then having the executive stand up and have him, him or her say, we're here to capture your sentiment in the proceedings. We plan to act on some of the things in the proceedings in the next 90 days. The proceedings are really important. When the, when the executive says that, people figure out, okay, we're going to write a new story in this meeting today. And it's going to show, it's going to be documented in those proceedings because Bob and Mary and Jill, they all just said that that's going to be input into decision-making on a go forward, those proceedings. So this is a very different approach to uh, transformation. I would say it's extremely agile. Okay. So the way think about it just think about this for a minute i'm gonna let's have a moment of silence after i say this okay around the world today we use defined process a we first we do a then we do b then we do c we use defined process to implement an empirical process i mean just think about it just take 10 seconds and just think to think about that for a minute um, I would say a little bit different. So in Western Europe is uh, now we are in the VUCA, right? Is uh, in the black swarm, nothing planned. So you have to manage. And so we have different, different countries, different cultures reacting completely differently. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite lucky living in Germany. So what we see is, okay, say we don't care what's coming in the future. Now we have to act as a collective is not acting as an individual. So all the, the compliance thing processes uh, away, I don't need it, is now to think about things. So it's right problem solving. But uh, you're completely right, is we discovered that all the processes we all had are all obsolete. They're meaningless, right? So usually you accept it just to not uh, challenge the conversation or not challenging the communication with your with your colleague because uh, he's thinking in the process way that's his language and that's okay yeah Catherine's got something she wants to say yes I was uh, attending a very interesting conference with David Snowden about coronavirus and how it impacts our future our present and the way uh, we manage it and he said that we are very likely in, in chaos, that is, in a place where we have to invent processes, where we cannot seek a secure ending to this with defined process already. We need to connect, uh, move, uh, you, know, you know, as the kind of find is, uh, it is, the chaos is a place where we've got to move and empirically see what happens and we'll know what will happen and open space agility as you have um, taught this uh, to me one year ago is also something like this we don't know what will come out of this one or two days and this yeah, is yeah, the yeah, yeah. yeah i love that i totally and, love that so, thank you so much for saying that catherine i really appreciate it and, and um, first, if i may ahead. add uh, another observation, I think uh, uh, very much uh, was fascinating was what uh, Catherine just uh, mentioned. Uh, building on top of that, uh, also the different models being discussed, not just about the, um, you know, the, the, the process and how much we actually know of, of the future, very little, 
uh, but also how the uh, decision making happens, whether this is all centralized. So you have one central figure that knows it all and takes decisions <laughs> or whether we have and we actually understand and appreciate we have an invitation to a federated system and we actually know how to work that. I think this is what you can see really a difference between, you know, different states. And I think uh, Pierre has the same on mind than I do. Um, you know, we're a federated system in one case, maybe work and in others, maybe not. Right. So it's not the system as such. It is also how it is played. That's yeah. Yeah. Let me, that's beautiful, Wolfgang. Thank you. So, it's not the system as such, but it's how it how it's played. Okay, so this is actually key to the whole conversation, what you just said, because I'm gonna pull this up now. In 2012, I wrote this book, a book of local optimizations called The Culture Game. Culture turns out to be a game. And what Wolfgang said about play is dead on. Now, I wanna say one more thing about uh, my friend David Snowden. David Snowden, um, when you discuss open space with him, he'll go, mm, seems like, seems okay, but then dismissively, too easily gamed, much too easily gamed. Hey, I have news for you. That's not a bug. That's a feature, okay? When you bring people into open space and they know that the next open space is coming in 90 days. Please, please make me, please put me on speaker view so you can see this fully. When people experience the first open space over here, what happens is they figure out open space. Then they do experiments with new ways of working. They know we're going to have another open space in 90 days. Do you think they talk about that meeting? Now that they know how open space works from the first event, do you think they talk about how they're going to play the second event? Yeah, they sure do. And are some of them going to going to going to hijack, try to hijack the culture of the meeting and change it and, and move it in the direction they want it to go? Yeah, they most certainly are. And that's called self-organization. Okay, that's not called. I mean, all self-organization is gaming. I'm crying out loud. Think it through. Just think it through for a minute. So what we're doing is we're leveraging the fact that people have a sense of control coming out of OST1. They know how open space goes. They know the game and they play better the second time. Let me tell you the 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 the, the sessions are much more focused on a few things. There's fewer of them. Sometimes there's fewer people because they realize they don't have to go to the meeting unless they're they, the first one they went to, they felt they might have been compelled to go. Second one, they know they don't have to. So only the passionate, responsible people are there, and they're gonna they're gonna grab that meeting and go with it. This actually happened to me in an organization. In the third open space we did, uh, be ahead of it, the scrum masters went to the product person, and they wanted a product roadmap because we didn't have a product roadmap, and this guy was a command control type. And he didn't want to have no road mapping meeting. So going into the sec the third open space, these two scrum masters conspired with other people to make the meeting all about road mapping. And that's exactly what they did. They called sessions all about road mapping. They raised questions about six months, 12 months, 18 months out. Why don't we have a road map, et cetera? It made it into the proceedings. Um, they asked him again. He said, no, they went to his boss. They got that road mapping meeting. It was a half a day meeting. The whole company went to it. Those two scrum masters facilitated it. They got an 18 month roadmap. And three weeks later, that guy quit. That head of product guy, he quit. Uh, you know, it, this is interesting because this is how we proceed with the uh, strategy planning, the quarterly strategy planning, exactly like your model. So you have 90 days versus three months. So, and, and this is open space. We call collective decision making. Because it's collective, you get the point you measure at the beginning is engagement. No, I get you very well. Right. And it's a really good idea um, ahead of if you're going to do open space to, to measure the engagement levels before the first open space and then immediately after. And there's going to be a dramatic difference in employee engagement. 
And you can use employee engagement as uh, a foundation or platform to stand on when you uh, make your case for employee engagement. You can use the Gallup data. The Gallup data, you know, from the Gallup organization, if you Google Gallup engagement, there's a mound of data from Gallup that associates employee engagement with every good thing you would ever want. Are you tell the Gallup question is called the, the Q12, yeah. the 12th question about engagement. Yeah. And, and there's another trick is measuring alignment, which okay. is the same. If you're not engaged, you're not aligned. Describe that to me. How does it go? What? Alignment? This alignment thing. Like, how do you measure it? Uh, it was the last session about mirror, mirror. So again, you have questions. You ask questions. You okay. raise up. Meaning, you, you run your open space. You run this meeting. And then you send questions, maybe one before, after. And you say just the delta. And you say where you have to point to action. Here's okay. where you measure. Uh, uh, is, let's say, the development team aligned with the management? Is the management aligned with the business? Is the business aligned with the team? Or all the guys aligned? Which is quite oh. old thing from case and right. And, and it's, in, in fact, it's just about engagement. So if people are not engaged, they're doing bad things. Well, then why, why aren't we talking about employee engagement in the agile industry today? How come, why is it that the, um, the frameworks themselves have nothing to say about devices or mechanisms or, or tools or techniques for engagement? Why is it that we talk about business agility up one side and down the other, but we don't talk about specific techniques to engage people? It makes no sense. It's actually ridiculous is what it is, which is why I actually tweeted today that uh, I don't know how I said, it said something like agile is just a train wreck. And the so-called leaders of the industry have not engaged in good stewardship. And just, it's not my industry. You know, the end, I think, is how the tweet went. Because we're, we're, we're literally harming people at work by pushing them around. It makes no sense. You know, most people in engineering are, for the most part, more introverted than the average person. Yeah, there's some introverts. There's some extroverts in engineering. Agile came out of engineering, software engineering. And software engineering is notorious for having really bright, intelligent introverts in its, in its uh, population. You know, and something really terrible happens when you don't ask an introvert what they think. And that terrible thing is they don't tell you. They don't tell you. They might disengage. Yeah. Yeah. So when you bring mandated agile to an organization, by definition, we know that the best people have options. <laughs> that's, that's why they're the best, because they have options. And that's why they have options, because they're the best. And they will polish that resume and they will loiter by the exits if a totalitarian approach to decision making that centralizes decision making authority happens all in the name of love and collaboration. There's a tightening of decision authority. When that happens, your best people leave. Those are the same people that could champion the change. So around the world today, uh, no one, uh, for whatever reason, cares to speak about this. Maybe it's because, who knows? Who knows why? And, of course, my statement is easily attacked that, you know, there's nobody talking about this at all. Yes, there's some people talking about it. Yeah. But they're not engaging in any kind of global level change. So, here, I'm going to say something to you that's probably going to be hard for you to take. Here's what it is. You might be thinking to yourself, yeah, I go into those organizations and they mandate Agile, but you know, I don't force anything on my teams and I'm kind and I'm respectful to my teams and I would never force them to do anything like I would never force my coaching on them and blah, 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 blah. Well, hey, guess what? The system drives everything. What you're doing is engaging in local optimizations with the teams that you coach, but you're not really changing anything. 
you're not changing anything because you haven't challenged the executives about these fundamental things around employee engagement and inviting. So, you know, in some sense, we're all full of shit because we're unwilling or unable to say the things that need to be said, that employee engagement is essential, that inviting people is fundamentally respectful and a primary way to engage people, okay? And when you try to get this conversation going, the people who are currently stewarding the, the, what we call the agile industry, um, they got nothing to say. They don't wanna have the conversation. I have no idea why. So I hope that you'll be challenged to have the conversation with the companies you do business with. Um, we're teaching this class. Um, I'm going to put the link inside the, the, um, the chat where you can learn about this class and the other classes that I teach. And I hope that you'll come to them. I'm going to put it in now. I have a question to you. Um, so when you talk about the invitation based leadership, you know, no matter how much it is connected to open space or not. Yeah. Um, I see, you know, you talk about change. I can imagine you can also talk about projects. What is the space that you give invitation-based leadership and does it have an end in terms of when you think about running a whole organization this way, which at the end has to find a task to resource match, you know, and everything that needs to be done has to be done. Otherwise the product doesn't leave. Um, would you go, would you say invitation-based leadership equally works for everything or is there kind of some areas like change, like projects where it works better and others where it works less, is less apt? All right, all right. So let's, let's, let's just check in on some assumptions. Um, do people generally do what they want, no matter what they're told? Or not? I mean, you know. I think so, yeah. There's a, there's a term, malicious compliance, right? Have you ever heard of that? That's where you do the, the, the letter of what was requested, even though it wasn't, uh, it didn't produce the desired effect, you know? Um, you follow the exact thing, even though you know it's gonna produce a bad outcome, right? That's malicious compliance. So that's what you're gonna get. Uh, you're also going to get high levels of resentment that has nothing to do with anything good resentment's the opposite of engagement you're just generating resentment and you're generating resentment in the very people who could champion the change the independent thinkers so i have a challenge for you i think the whole world is self-organizing and self-managing and that um to deny this reality is to actually live in a dream world I think what leaders have to do is create the conditions where there is a space that's not too big, not too tight, but just right. It gives the right level of freedom and autonomy while also having the constraints that move the system in the direction where they want it to go. That is an art form. And it's basically leadership as game design. So, you know, I know I'm kind of rambling here. I want to take a couple of questions and then, um, then I think we'll go for the beginning of the end. How's that? Hey, Daniel, what I hear, uh, Paul here. Hey, uh, good, good stuff as always. Um, what I heard you say there at the end was you're optimizing where the organization could go. Is that, yeah. is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so, in the book, there's a diagram, you know, like uh, not too tight, not too loose, kind of just right in terms of the boundaries and constraints. So we have a whole chapter on boundary and constraints, right? So um, leadership teams create the what, what people commonly call guardrails, right? Which are the, the boundary structure that creates the container that people work in. So leaders are in the business of creating experiences for people in groups. So what's the experience from the time you get out of your car and, and get it, walk through the parking lot and go, go, go through the office and into your place of work and the meetings you, you experience and the way you work? What is the, desi what is the design of that experience? Is it random or is it you know, designed? So what we argue for in the Inviting Leadership book 
is that leadership should be inviting people to play a game that they design. Okay, and open space gives you a template for that. And you can teach them how to do that by using that template. So here's the last thing I want to say about open space, and I'll take another question. I want you to use open space or better if you can find it to engage the whole group. If you can find something better than open space, by all means, ditch on open space and use that instead. I just haven't found anything better. And the second thing is the use of iteration, inspection, adaptation, experimentation. Those four things are, are in open space agility because open space agility implements an enterprise wide iteration of change punctuated by two open spaces in the beginning and the end. If you can find a better way to help people make sense of the change, go and you go and do that. Open space agility breaks it into pieces that are 45 to 90 days long that everyone can refer to. Oh, remember that was after the first open space. That was after the second one. And it makes it easier for people to make sense and make meaning of the change. So I hope this has been thought provoking and I hope you take a stab at some of this as you move forward in your own work. Catherine, you had a question? Yeah, uh, it was not a question, it was a comment. My opinion on this is that those 45 days before the open space agility, all the time it takes for preparation, developing influence, as people like to call it in Canada, mm -hmm. all that is a, the very hard job. This is where the hard job is. It is before, because once, you know, as, as I've lived open spaces out of organizations and conferences, when we, when we are in the open space, we're leaving. There is a natural, when we are mobile, there is a natural flow that goes around the day. But it is before to invite the leaders, to convince them, to help them write that invitation. That is where the hard job to me is. What, what do you say? It's, it's, how many people have been involved with Agile for more than seven years? Show of hands. Do you still believe stuff that you believed four years ago? Right? Like most of the stuff, no, no, I never believed it, right? Okay. I mean, there's, I believed it at the time, but it was wrong because I, I matured. I, I, I developed new ideas. Yeah. Evolution of thought. Yeah, evolution of thought. So you have to have some empathy and patience with these executive leaders. They don't know anything. You do. You need to be gentle and considerate and kind about it because they are not where you are. And it's unreasonable to expect them to immediately grasp what you're teaching them. You need to give them direct experiences. That's why that, it's, that's why that executive told me, oh, after we did it, then it totally clicked for me. Not in the conference, in our actual company with my leadership team, it just, I got it, boom. So we have to have some empathy for these executives. There's some things about executives I want to, I want to say in closing, okay? Um, in the nineties, in the nineties, I had, I had 50 people reporting to me. We, we, I uh, had a services firm that del develop, um, delivered services on Microsoft platforms and tools, three offices in three States, 50 people. I can tell you some things about it. Okay. Here's the first thing. Leadership is lonely. Your authority completely isolates you from your people. They cannot give you a straight answer because they're always filtering it through the authority filter because you've got them by their job. You could, you could threaten their livelihood and they're going to give you the answer that you think that they think you want. Second thing is half the time you have to make decisions that don't have any, um, they're dealing with incomplete information. You have to make decisions by the seat of your pants. And some of these decisions are in the million, multi millions of dollars. So you're, you're fundamentally insecure. And then the third thing is, 
you have to act confident the whole time. Because after all, you know, you're the, you know, people, people are expecting you to know what you're talking about. So try to have some empathy when you coach them, because it's not as easy as it looks. And challenge them as well. That's important. If you don't challenge them, then you're not going to be dealt with as a trusted advisor. You're going to be dealt with as a hired help. That's not a role that you want to take up. These are just another Archer team. Say it again. It's just another, another Archer team. No, it's not just another Agile team. It's an Agile team that's got budget authority. Yeah, and the other have the, the brain and, and the hands to um, make the, the strategy happen. Because if you have just the money, it makes sense. It's a balance. It's all about negotiation. Right. So I think that's pretty much the summary here. Eva's got a question. Is that correct? No? Okay. Is there more that I can answer before we get near the middle of the end here? I've got a question. Sure. How do you drive fear out? How do you drive fear out? Because everyone's, a everyone's got, there's a lot of fear in the system just now. I was at a call today where people were told there's 5% cuts in the department. Everyone's terrified because they think they're the 5%. Everyone's waiting for the phone to ring. In business across the world, we're heading into a huge financial crisis. So everyone's gripped in that uh, psychological state. Sorry, I was giving you thinking time. <laughs> the best way I know to get rid of fear is to show some consideration for the people for what they think and feel. That'll take the fear out. And open space is a great, is a great uh, venue for that. To actually hear what people have to say, what they think, what they feel, and what they want. And then you can gauge, you know, we spend a you know, million dollars get spent on agile, so-called agile transformations. Um, the reality is that the agile processes and practices are so good that if you just do agile in name only, in other words, no changing of the decision rights at all, just the, just the ceremonies, you get a 10 or 15% improvement in what you're measuring. That gets sold as transformation around the world every single day. It's not transformation. So real transformation would be transformation of how decisions get made. Yet this gets sold as transformation and everyone accepts it around the world. So, you know, this is actually a crime um, of the first order. And, um, you know, we can all do better. So getting people, hearing what people want, think, and feel is a primary way to drive out fear. Um, that's the story I'm sticking with. Can I take another question or two? I have a question. Just curious about your opinion on liberating structures. What, like performance reviews? Uh, liberating structures. Oh, liberating structures. Yeah, I guess I have some opinions about that. So do you want me to express them? Yes, I'm curious. I think liberating structures are a tremendous idea. I think every single liberating structure should be published under an open source license, like Open Space Agility and like Scrum itself. If you look at the liberating structures license, it's not an open source license. You cannot commercialize uh, one of your derivations. Uh, you can use it internally in your own company, uh, but you cannot commercialize those. I think that's a crime. Um, there's actually a spot um, on the Open Space Net, uh, Open Leadership Network site where we talk about progress, and progress is is enhanced and supported and encouraged through open source licensing of culture technology. So, for example, Open Space Agility is open source, and so, by the way, is Open Space Beta from Nils Flaging because it's based on on Open Space Agility and in Prime OS. You know, what does it mean? It means it's free to the world. If you can improve open space agility, go ahead and be my guest, call it whatever you want and go and commercialize that. Two things have to happen though. You need to, you need to refer back to my work as the source of, of, of your work, the basis of your derivation. And you need to offer your derivation on the same exact free terms that you received my work on. Okay, so I would love to see liberating structures published in that way. Um, 
And then the, the liberating structures in general are a collection of things that have been around for a really long time. So I have a challenge for you. Why don't you go and become a designer of your own liberating structures? Why don't you go and think of yourself as, as a designer of games? Because that's what meetings actually are. In this book, that's what, we, that's what we assert, that all meetings are games and all classes are meetings. Therefore, all classes are games. You can go ahead and create designed experiences and you can encourage executives to do the same. Whole group designed experiences will get you a very long way. That's what open space is about. That's what open space agility is about. And that's my rant on liberating structures. I mean, I could tell you how I really feel. That's a joke, right? It's like, yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> I okay. need you. So I think we're near the end of the end now. Can I take another question or two before we uh, deconvene here? Or before I go away anyway? Marcus, any questions? Michael Leber. Well, yeah, maybe. I think it's it's a it's a great example for a systemic approach, really to to um, to frame uh, to to well to frame transformation in a complex system. This is my let's say my learning of of it all. So. Yeah, and don't forget when they game the open space. That's not a bug, that's a feature. It's called self-organization, okay? They figured out the game, they're gonna play better the second time, the third time, the fourth time, and that's exactly what you want. <clears throat> Otherwise, all we're doing is pretending. We're just making things up, you know? How, when, how and when will the Agile Alliance, the Scrum Alliance, and every other institution in, in the Agile industry come out with some kind of statement on employee engagement. That's not the purpose. Uh, wait, it's an illustration. Anyway. Please, 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 just stop right there. <laughs> then, okay. Then, 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 then let's put it this way. If the forcing of Agile is not the most pressing issue of our time, and the institutions have nothing to say about it, then we're all authorizing that together. We're all happy with the way things are, okay? We like things the way they are. That's why we're not doing anything about it. And that's the same attitude that the institutions have. They like things the way they are. That's why they're not doing anything about it. That's why they don't have a position paper. That's why you can't find out where they stand because they'll never tell you because there's too much money in the current situation. I'm not sure that's the situa the reason, but obviously people are getting something out of it and we're all playing along. So, you know, I think we could do better. And I hope that some of the stuff that I presented here can help you. This is a book of local optimization, 16 lo local optimizations that any manager can use to make, their, make things better in their little part of the world. They'll never change the whole system with that book. Those are local optimizations. This book here, is uh, inviting leadership I already told you about. And this one, Open Space Agility. This is basically the website, you know, in a book. You can just go to openspaceagility.com and get all this information. It's free to the world. It's published open source. Doesn't cost you a penny. Go and improve it. Make it better if you can. I look forward to hearing from you. And then the third book generalizes all those things and covers a lot of the material that you and I just covered inside this uh, this, this time we had together. You know, I covered a lot. I covered the authority circle. I covered grief. Um, I covered a lot of different things and, and the fundamentals of invitation. I hope that that gave you a taste of what's in these, these, these classes. If you go to newtechusa.net and click training, um, I put the link inside the, the chat. Uh, you can learn about how to take this class uh, with me and the other co-author, Mark Sheffield. And, um, you know, it's been my pleasure to be with you today, and I hope that it's in some small way um, 
been useful and edifying for you in, in that you've taken something away that you can personally use. Thank you so much for your time, Daniel. It was very awesome. So can you put all yourself all in Gary view? Well, and so and oh, everyone? All right. And everyone opens uh, its mic. Open your mics. Yeah. I want to have a random applause. <laughs> I miss the noise each time, you know? Thank you, sir. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Hijack Mike. Mike, no last questions? No. <laughs> okay, Thanks thank you so much. Thank you for your time, guys. Yep. Take care, be safe, yeah. wash your hands, wear your masks, and be safe. Good to see you next time. And next week with Judy. Yes. Okay. Okay, bye-bye.